to clarify the reason I'm not in New York is because uh, you got there first uh, and you were prepared to pay my fare and they weren't prepared. To, uh, so, so thank you very much for inviting me here. I was going to talk, um, the title that um, Stuart gave me was Tax Haven Britain. I was going to call this talk A Funeral for Tina. Does anyone know who Tina is? Mrs. Thatcher's famous quote, there is no alternative, Tina. What a stupid thing to say. There are always alternatives, many alternatives. And for someone who has talked so much about giving people choice to then say there is no alternative, it struck me as a particularly dark thing to say. The point we're at politically at the moment is a fascinating point. We've had 40 years now of a particular political economic ideology. Some call it neoliberalism. Some people call it the Washington Consensus. Stuart just called it the Mon... Sorry, Steve. Steve. I think it was Stuart, uh, the City of Stuart London. Steve Pelerin. just called, called it the Mont Pelerin Society Consensus. And that's a very interesting reference. Um, it's failed. It has failed comprehensively on its own terms, let alone on our terms. So this is a fascinating time for us to start talking about new alternatives. And I think that John McDonnell and Jeremy Corbyn's election, and we've seen something similar just happen in Canada with Trudeau's election, mm -hmm. signals an interest in a completely new sense of direction, a new direction. And economics needs that new direction as much as anything else because economics as a discipline, and I've been an economist now for 40 years, failed miserably. I'll give you a sense of its failure. A few years ago, I did a Today program interview with uh, a discussion between me and a guy called Richard Lambert. You might have heard of Richard Lambert. He used to be the editor of the Financial Times and more recently has been the president of CBI. And he was going on about how fantastic the city of London is as a, a, a major asset for this country um, and um, that the best thing to do with the city of London was to further deregulate it um, because politicians, every time they interfere with the city of London, um, just make things matters worse. So he was saying further deregulation is required. The point at which he was saying this was really interesting. He was, this interview happened in January 2007, just ahead of the collapse of the entire city of London. And it would have collapsed entirely had Alistair Darling not intervened as comprehensively and as quickly as he did. It, one of the most extraordinary things about Darling and Brown was their most successful moment was at the point when their, 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 their strategy collapsed. They did succeed in rescuing capitalism from itself. So we now have a really interesting choice, and I think we all of us need to participate in shaping that choice. Corbyn is talking about something completely different. He's not talking about reversing back to the 1970s, as the Red Top Papers would pretend. He is talking about a quite different type of economics um, I'm not going to talk about people's quantitative easing because my colleague Richard Murphy is coming down in February, so you can hear more about it from him. But the, the possibilities of using quantitative easing are simply enormous. My own proposal would be to immediately use people's quantitative easing to quite simply buy up every single private finance initiative payment across the National Health Service and the Educational Service, simply rid the education and health services of this preposterous debt which the Treasury, and I've been an advisor to the Treasury in the past. I, um, when I was the economic advisor to the government of Jersey, I had a lot of work uh, dealings with the Treasury and, more, and have recently also worked with the Treasury right up to the point where Gordon Brown, Richard Murphy and I fell out very almost spectacularly. I'll get to that in a couple of minutes' time. But the Treasury have, for some reason, um, got a strong aversion to, to people's point of easing. They say it is inflationary. My view, and I think most economists' view, is there are no inflationary prospects whatsoever, particularly if you're buying up 
debt instruments around PFI. But the PFI project is, is a, a, one of the biggest failings um, of economic policy. The idea that you know, we could take on 30-year contracts to deliver hospitals to the National Health Service and treat this not as a debt but an off-balance sheet asset was quite simply a lie to the public. I don't want to go on that t too far down that route. I want to talk about why new strategies are, are needed to address the structural problems that Britain faces. We bought in, through Mrs Thatcher, into what's called the Washington Consensus. I'll very quickly tell you what that is in a few minutes' time. You'll be familiar with most of it. But we now face some astonishing structural problems. Despite apparently leading the world, according to the BBC this morning, in growth. The growth that we have at the moment is spectacularly weak. And I can tell you that most economists are very, very concerned at how weak growth is across the world. But it's been particularly weak in, in the sense that, yet again, we've had to lead growth through asset bubbles, housing bubbles, the jobs that have been created have been very, very poor quality jobs, an astonishing proportion, over 80% of the jobs that have been created in the last three years are self-employed jobs with extremely low salaries, extremely poor prospects, and very poor working conditions and so on, high risks involved. Um, productivity in the UK is one of the lowest amongst the leading industrial nations. We still suffer from a, a dominant financial capitalism and state capture. The Labour Party is as captive to the City of London, or was as captive to the City of London, as the Tory Party and the Lib Dems. Uh, I've had a lot of experience of that myself. Uh, for quite a long period, Richard Murphy and I and a few others had regular meetings with Brooke Gordon Brown's Treasury team Virtually every time we met in the Treasury, the people we met with came out of PricewaterhouseCoopers or Goldman Sachs. They weren't the traditional civil servant economists like I was when I went into the service. So we have a, a huge structural problem. And I think that problem has a name. I call it the finance curse. It's what I came down to talk about the last time. I'll mention it briefly now. But I want to talk more broadly about why we now need to have a discussion in Britain about what kind of development strategy we want to have going forward. My day job is to run the global tax justice movement, which is actually a movement in three parts. I don't expect you to remember any of this at all. If, but if you've heard of the Tax Justice Network, we're a, net, a network of experts. We were set up, and I set it up, it's now a global movement, specifically to counter the Mont Pelerin Society. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. There's a bit of history here. But the Mont Pelerin Society is this... Not particularly hidden, but no one's ever heard, no one's ever talked or heard about them. Uh, organisation that was created immediately after World War II to counter Roosevelt's New Deal and the welfare state European social democratic model. They set themselves up to undermine that whole thing. They didn't do it clandestinely, but what was interesting was right from word go, <coughs> the Bank of England was sponsoring them. The Bank of England, which had just been nationalised, was busy sponsoring the enemy, so to speak, um, who were out to undermine Clement Attlee and the whole of the European Social Democratic Settlement. So this is a movement, uh, the network in three parts. I work a lot with investigative journalists under the title of Finance Uncovered. We've done a lot of the investigations you'll have heard about, Starbucks, Amazon, Google, and so on. Uh, and we have a global alliance which brings together big campaigning organisations like Oxfam and Christian Aid in this country and their equivalents around the world. So that's my day job. But alongside this, I do a lot of um, work, um, critical analysis of Britain and uh, other industrial strategies. This article, I'm not sure if you can all read the whole thing, this is an article which Richard Murphy and I had published in Red Pepper, um, magazine in August 2006. Um, and what was unusual about it was that this is the first time that any, anyone had, had the, the kind of had, had the temerity from the left to criticize Gordon Brown's policies as a chancellor 
you might remember at that time he was the big stumping fist chancellor and he could do no wrong and we said actually um, his policies are fundamentally misguided from the <coughs> go. specifically in this article um, we, we were concerned about his tax policies and I'm going to largely focus upon that I don't want to take Richard's thunder away from him but going back for quite a few years to the early 1990s you might remember that under John, John Smith's Prime Ministership, we, the Labour Party started this policy of trying to win allies in the City of London. They ran this prawn cocktail offensive. Do you remember that? Yeah. For two years, they went round the City of London boardroom saying, the Labour Party is your friend. We, will, we now accept that Mrs Thatcher's deregulation of the City of London is in Britain's interests, we will not reverse that. In fact, we will carry it forward. They entered into what I regard as a Faustian pact with the City of London. They said, we'll deregulate, you go and create the wealth, we'll use the tax revenues to boost public spending, and we'll borrow plenty of money to boost the economy and build all those PFI-led hospitals and and schools. Um, that was a Faustian pact which fell apart spectacularly in 2007-2008. That deregulation, that further deregulation beyond Mrs Thatcher's 1986 Big Bang deregulation was what set us almost inevitably on track for the great financial crisis. And we were very critical of in fact, regularly between 2001 through to about 2006, when this was article was published, we met the Treasury teams and we said, look, there are big, big unknown risks building up in the economy. The idea, by the way, that this, the crash came out of nowhere is a nonsense. Everyone in the city knew it. Lots of economists were talking about it and saying it was inevitable. Um, it's, it's, it's a mystery to me how it, you know, uh, how it didn't get more into the, into the public discourse. But the idea at that time was the government should not intervene because the banks understand risk better than the, gov than the government could possibly do. And that, I think that idea is absolutely um, wrong because the banks knew all along that when things went wrong, the government would intervene. My criticism of, um, anyway, Michael Heseltine famously said about that Labour Party prawn cocktail offensive, and I, for once, agree with Michael Heseltine, never have so many crustacea died in vain. I actually think, <laughs> I think it did the worst things of all to the Labour Party. It made the Labour Party captive to the City of London's interests, and my God, did they take advantage of that. They simply filled out the Labour Party at the top end with all of their people. So when, as I said, when we met with Ed Balls and his team, guess who we were meeting? We were meeting PricewaterhouseCoopers and Goldman Sachs. We're well rid of him. Um, but meanwhile, John McDonald was sitting there with a parliamentary left economic advisers panel, um, which wasn't, by the way, exclusively Labour Party. Lib Dems came occasionally, even a Tory or two would turn up to our discussions, but by and large, we were totally ignored. But we were very critical of what was happening during Gordon Brown's ch chancellorship. We were critical of the degree to which he was captive to City of London, London's interests, to the point where Gordon Brown was, and still, I'm afraid, regrettably still is, pushing for further deregulation, blocking Brussels from trying to, amongst other things, introduce a financial transaction tax. Um, Gordon Brown was a leading proponent within Europe of the need for the state to compete. Can I ask you for one second to think about what the hell does it mean for a state to compete? Do states really compete? Do we really compete with China, with the Chinese government? Do we compete with the German government? What exactly does this mean? But the whole rubric of what he was talking about, and you hear it all the time, was we must compete on regulation. In other words, we must deregulate in a race to the bottom. We must compete on tax. In other words, we must tax the rich less, and we must tax powerful companies less. 
And that was where we were particularly critical because m many of the people who were involved right from the word go in Tax Justice Network were very senior revenue people. And they were telling us every time we enter negotiations with a big company, a message comes down from number 11, go easy. Tax the little companies, by all means be heavy with them, but forget about taxing the big companies because Blair doesn't like that, because it means it wins Labour, this anti-business headline in the papers. So time and again, we knew that Gordon Brown would be the first person at the table to blink when it came to negotiations with multinational companies. He lowered corporation tax rates, and more recently, Labor, the new Labour have supported the government's position on patent boxes and a whole load of other tax haven facilities, which Britain has been quietly introducing. The Labour Party is supporting this. He took no action against the non-domicile rule, which has allowed all sorts of crooks from all sorts of countries to come to Britain, massively invest in London property markets, making London property largely unaffordable to ordinary people. Um, and for the greater part of them, they, they pay no or very low rates of tax in this country. He constantly blocked international attempts to tackle tax havens. And I've been in on those. I'm a member of the Organisation for Economic Cooperation's Tax and Development um, gr a group. I'm also an, a senior advisor and expert advisor to the, to the Council of Europe. And every time I talk to people there in Europe, either in Paris or in Brussels, they tell me it's Britain and Ireland that are constantly blocking attempts to, to tackle this problem. They were deliberately weakened compliance with anti-money laundering regulation because the City of London is a, is, is, is a wash with dirty money. <coughs> Particularly weak on taxing multinational companies, they failed to implement any kind of progressive tax reforms, particularly a financial transaction tax and a land value tax, all of which, by the way, had been discussed and were supposedly part of the Labour Party policy before Blair was elected. That's what we mentioned in this article. <coughs> we could have gone on to a whole host of other things, including private financial initiatives, but this article um, angered B Brown so much that he stopped talking with us. Um, and worse, but I want to go into that. Um, and finally, and perhaps this is the worst problem of all, Brown started the process of depleting the capacity of HM Revenue and Customs, which have lo has lost tens of thousands of staff and no longer actually has the capacity to, to run a modern tax service. Now, that badly depleted, which is why we've had endless problems around tax credits and family credits <coughs> and so on, because they simply don't have the staff, and we, they don't have the staff to tax multi big multinational companies. So one of the things that John McDonnell has already committed to is a comprehensive review of the needs of HM revenue and customs, because you cannot run a state without an effective revenue and cu customs and revenue organization. So that's one of his first commitments. Hurrah. I could go on, but I won't. I just want to t t give you some idea of the tally. At that time, this is before the Tories took over, what was the t cost to the United Kingdom of all the tax avoidance, the tax evasion, and the uncollected tax because HMRC wasn't fit for purpose. Well, at that, in 20, 2010, Richard Murphy, who's coming here in February, you can talk to me more about this, computed that the total tally for the United Kingdom was 123 billion. Um, I don't think it's diminished a great deal. HM Revenue and Customs, their estimate at the time was 45 billion. Now, we've got to be very careful about this because even if we beefed up HM Revenue and Customs, we can't possibly pretend that they'd be able to collect all of that sum. But even if they collected 25% of that sum, we would have no need for the austerity programs that have been foisted upon us. There's no need for it anyway. It's a political choice. But there is a, a damning indictment of our failure to actually tax effectively to run a modern state. And as someone wrote to the Guardian in 2014, Ian Beryl says that, the, that 100 billion is roughly the current cost of the health service. Roughly the current cost of corporate and elite tax avoidance and scams is 120 billion. 
Now, what could we do with the excess 20 billion? Uh, that just about says it all. It's a political choice. It's a political choice to not tax multinational companies. It's a political choice to not tax the rich people. The idea which comes out of the neoliberal consensus that if you tax the rich people, they will somehow withdraw their investment is an absolute nonsense. The idea of the Lapper curve, for those of you who are familiar with the idea of Lapper curve, that if you actually lower the tax rate on the rich, they will invest more and that, and that will boost the economy to such an extent that we'll actually all be better off by cutting taxes. It's a nonsense. It's never worked anywhere. The one place where Arthur Lapper actually managed to get the government to implement his policies, which is the state of Kentucky, is technically bankrupt. But anyway, that's been, that was the underlying tax policy that Thatcher introduced, the so-called supply-side economics, that Blair carried forward through Brown's chancellorship, and that Osborne's carrying on now. Cut taxes on the rich and we'll all be better off. I don't think for one second that stacks up. In fact, what's happened is that since Thatcher triggered off the neoliberal period, the so-called current period of globalization by completely liberalizing capital controls, exchange rates and so on. Um, the model of globalization that we've had, and which I want to explore at some length now, has made things dramatically worse. Um, but that model is neither necessary nor inevitable. There are alternatives, and it's time that we started looking at those alternatives. But we in Britain have taken that model to an extreme. Britain is probably the most extreme application of supply-side economics, neoliberal economics, whatever you want to call them, um, in the planet. Briefly, New Zealand did it in the 1980s and devastated their, their economy, but we, we've taken it further and far, faster. So that's what I want to... to um, talk about, but it's time for a quick commercial break. We've just published a new book called <laughs> The Greatest Invention, uh, and that's a very provocative title, but what we're saying uh, in that title, there you are, The Greatest Invention, Tax and the Campaign for a Just Society, is that tax is absolutely crucial to a modern society. It's the way in which complete strangers, like you and me, get together and organise to pay for health and justice and roads and security, and education, and all of the good things that we all need, but seem to have forgotten that it costs a great deal of money. The health service, despite what Mr. Osborne says, is not free. It costs a great deal of money. And that money comes from tax, by and large. Um, so I'd like you to, you know, I've just bought a few copies. I'd like you to think just for a few seconds about why tax is so important and why tax policy uh, is so important to a modern society. It's not just about raising revenue to pay for the health services. Of course that's important, but actually if the government wanted to pay for the health services, it could simply print the money. Might be inflationary at some stage, but by and large, the government, that's the interesting thing about the state, the state has the ability to print money. It's also about redistribution, something which Reagan and Thatcher wanted to bury. They wanted to bury the idea that tax can be used for re to redistribute wealth. But in a, any capitalist society, wealth and income is massively maldistributed, becomes highly concentrated, has become even more concentrated in the last 20 years, and the, r the rate of concentration of wealth accumulation has actually accelerated in the last five years after the great financial crisis. <coughs> So the 1% are now the 0.1%. It's also necessary to, to help reprice where the markets fail. Um, think, for example, about hydrocarbon markets. Um, the real, real price of hydrocarbons, of, of petrol, the pump, and the oil products, would be spectacularly low because the cost of producing is actually m marginal if we did not intervene into the markets. When the markets fail, obviously they fail to take account of pollution and other, the, 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 the um, problems caused by burning hydrocarbon, climate change and all of that. So we choose to reprice hydrocarbon products. We choose to, choose to reprice um, uh, things like um, tobacco and alcohol. 
in distant memory, we chose to, chose to reprice housing by, for example, providing a lot of social housing and building housing, affordable housing for people because we recognise the markets do not actually provide enough housing to meet people's needs. And perhaps most interestingly, tax is at the heart of this of, of the democratic system. It's the heart of this, the, the, the citizen-state relationship. We talk about this, the social contract. We elect politicians to represent us. So economists, political economists, talk about the four R's of taxation. Far from being a bad thing, tax is a very good thing, and it's core to any social democratic project. Um, so when you hear someone say, as he did last year, that he hated tax, that someone being the Prime Minister, what you're hearing is a spoiled brat from Eton talking, revealing his ignorance. That's what he said, I hate tax. He probably hates paying tax, of course, his father yeah. famously uh, worked offshore in my island in Jersey and in Panama. Um, but that's what David Cameron said, I hate tax. By and large, the project of the last 40 years, by the way, has been to shift the tax charge away from the rich people and away from powerful corporations onto ordinary people. And they've done this by lowering the corporate tax rates and increasing VAT. Okay, time to talk about the big picture. And the big picture, which you probably know of as the neoliberalism. Have you all heard of the neoliberalism? Okay, or well, sometimes it's called neoclassical. I think there's a distinction between neoclassical and neoliberalism, but you probably don't want to here get too involved in the kind of the academic side of it. It's also known as the Washington Consensus. Why Washington? Because that's where the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund is, and they were totally captured by the, the Chicago School of Economics, Milton Friedman, um, in the 1960s and 1970s. And they came forward with a program which was based around trade liberalization, scrap all trade tariffs, scrap all trade um, measure, protection measures. For example, TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. Secondly, financial market liberalization, that is a scrap exchange controls, allow capital to move freely across the world, abolish the, the Bretton Woods consensus and how capital should be uh, carefully controlled. Tax cuts, tax cuts for target tax cuts on the rich in order to stimulate them to, to invest more. They, they need to get wealthier in order to make us wealthier apparently and privatise public assets. These are the four key columns of what's called the Washington Consensus. This is what Mrs Thatcher built her programme round. Um, you'll probably recognise it. You might not recognise it. It's called the Washington Consensus. This is the consensus that has failed. Its failure is now sufficiently well documented for us all to say, finished. What finished it off above all was the financial crash of 2008. Because after that, underlying this, at the very base of the economic theory, all of this was built on a particular theory called the efficient market hypothesis. I won't bother you with, but the, with the detail of that, but the efficient market hypothesis says that Markets will always allocate capital more effectively in the state. So the state should roll back and leave everything to the market. That idea, which any 19th century economist would have scratched their head over and said, no, I don't think so, that idea collapsed comprehensively. And that's why we now need to have a discussion across the Labour Party and across the public generally about what kind of new economics do we want. Because if you leave it to the politicians and to the academic economists, by and large, we'll get nowhere. Because that discussion is not happening. It's not hap it hasn't happened within the Labour Party until J Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonald came on the scene. Because they're talking about the need for something else. And the legacy MPs, by which I mean the people who bought in to this consensus, and by and large applied this consensus right the way through from 1997 till 2010, those legacy MPs are still trying to, to, to go back to this good old era of the Washington consensus. 
Okay, everyone with me so far? Mm. The only thing I would add to that is the determined attack on organised labour to keep the labour market quiet, keep rates of pay down. That's, that's, that's right. Um, yeah, certainly that was also part, not so much of the Washington Consensus, but part of the political agenda. Um, now, okay, so, so that's the background. The, the, the big story... That I, uh, that I talked about when I came here uh, in September to talk to the Humanist Association was the finance curse. Now, another thing about economics, um, which has come really come out in the last um, two decades, is a recognition that um, things like having too much oil and gas um, is not necessarily particularly good for the development of a country. Nigeria, for example, after it struck oil and started pumping oil, its domestic economy collapsed, and with it, its society, and with it, a lot of its political systems. It immediately triggered a war, the Biafra War, for those of you with very long memories, and so on. And that, that the problem with oil and gas and mineral exporting countries has a name. It's called the resource curse. It's recognised. Google it. There's a lot of literature about this idea of a resource curse and how <coughs> oil and and gas-rich countries actually suffer. Um, by the way, this, this card comes from a fantastic board game called War on Terror, another advertisement, which is really good. Um, Google that as well. It's great fun. It's got everything that Monopoly and Risk has, but in bund extra bundles. <laughs> the, the first major problem that comes out of uh, having too much oil and gas is known as the Dutch disease. The Dutch disease hit the Netherlands as soon as it's started pumping oil and gas in the 1960s, the Gilda, the exchange rate, went through the roof, which meant that all of its manufactured products for export became relatively more expensive on the global markets and imported goods became relatively cheaper. Um, and that very quickly hit the whole of the Dutch economy. They lost huge swathes of manufacturing. So, and, it's, and this is seen elsewhere. As... As that happened, as the oil sector became, <coughs> as the, the economy became more and more dependent upon oil, um, other sectors were crowded out of the economy, by which I mean that they, couldn't, they were no longer able to operate profitably, um, and oil took over as, the, uh, as the, the single large sector, destroying entrepreneurialism. The government started to suffer from massive revenue volatility as, as oil and gas prices go up and down. The governments became increasingly authoritarian because society was getting more and more divided. These are all the symptoms of the, what's called the resource curse. Now, the reason I'm talking about oil and gas economies is not because I necessarily want to focus on what happened to the North Sea oil and gas revenues, which were going to transform Britain but didn't, but because when this... Uh, this curse was being first explored in the 1990s. At that time, I was economic advisor to the government of Jersey across the water. Some of you might have visited Jersey. Go there often. It needs help. It needs more tourism. And the top line of my job description said that I, my job was to maintain a balanced and diversified economy. And yet I was noticing all of these symptoms in Jersey as its finance sector grew. Jersey was rapidly becoming a tax haven with a rapidly expanding banking sector and all of these symptoms, almost all of them, were beginning to um, become apparent, meaning making my job extremely difficult. And I've talked to politicians about it and they kind of condescend to me and say I wasn't very competent in my job. But I talked to the journalists and, and the, the economists who were exploring this overseas, and the parallels were just too obvious. And working with a journalist who actually wrote about the resource curse for the Financial Times and the Economist for a long time, his name is Nicholas Jackson, he and I wrote this book called The Finance Curse. On the back of my experience in Jersey, but also looking particularly at Britain, because we said that we could see exactly the same things happening in Britain. The Dutch disease, an overvalued exchange rate. The pound has been kept overvalued for decades, making it very much harder to export productive manufactured goods and services because 
it's that much less competitive against other currencies, which means that increasingly we are importing most of our goods and services. And this, this process has been going on for a very long time. Why has our, exp has, has our uh, exchange rate policy been so crazy and whose interest is it? It's in the interest exclusively of the City of London and their clients. It's not in the interest of the rest of Britain. Those of you will, with long memories will re recall that for some absurd reason, when we entered the exchange rate mechanism in 1992, we set a, an exchange rate of three Deutschmark to the pound, which was at least 30% overvalued. It famously collapsed. It couldn't possibly have done. But why did we do that? Because that's what the City of London wants. The City of London has been crowding out other interest, interest, industries. We've got the same brain drain. All the brightest and best are not going into the oil and gas sector. They're going into the City of London. We are literally seeing our brightest scientists go into hedge funding rather than into research and development of new technologies. Instead of seeing genuine entrepreneurial activity in the British economy, we have seen far too many people going into rent-seeking activity. Now, rent-seeking is not just people buying buy-to-let properties to rent out. It means people who are engaged in extracting wealth from the economy, and that's what the City of London does spectacularly well. It extracts wealth rather than creates wealth. Economists call it rent-seeking. We've seen the state capture, I've mentioned that earlier, the revolving doors between city, the City of London and government. We've seen a former Labour Prime Minister, for example, go and join the board of JP Morgan for a salary of two and a half thousand. What can he possibly be bringing to the, to the board of a major American bank apart from political influence? Shameful. But he's not alone. So I don't want to be too critical of the Labour Party, the old, you know, old new Labour, or new old Labour, whatever. But this, this was constant. This was happening. Mandelson did it. Hewitt did it. A whole lot of others did it. Um, we, you will no doubt have heard as often as I have this, these threats issued from the City of London. If you try to regulate us, we'll leave. We'll go to Dublin, or we'll go to Luxembourg, or we'll go to, to Zurich. Um, in my view... The best thing to do is to send a limousine round to the headquarters and say, go, <laughs> go as quickly as possible. Yeah. Walk the bone, you door the way out. Yes. <laughs> we've seen the corruption and we've seen the criminalisation. We all know about, you all know about LIBOR and exchange rate fixing and the mis-selling of insurance. Perhaps don't know as much as I do about the money laundering and the tax evasion and the way in which our senior bankers and the senior accountants and so on are all involved in financial skullduggery because it's very profitable. In other words, all the symptoms of, of the resource curse, the rising inequality, the increased poverty, the volatility, the crisis, all there. That's why we coined the phrase finance curse. Now, behind it, there's some very good news. Because for a long time... Gordon Brown's view was, sadly, there's nothing we can do about it. Blair's view was, productive activity, industry, so 19th century, so smokestack. Do you remember him talking about dying smokestack industries? Talk to the treasury teams, and they were saying, oh, no, no, Britain can't produce, but we can't compete with other countries. Our future lies in having an innovative knowledge, intelligence-based economy. <coughs> Do you remember all that crap? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, in other words, they gave up on this. Because they said, oh, we are now dependent on the City of London. Without the City of London, we will sink. And we did. Mm. Sorry, with the City of London, we sank. Mm -hmm. The good news about the finance curse analysis from a political economic point of view is we can actually say, this crowd, the City of London doesn't do what it says on the tin. It isn't good for the UK economy. It doesn't help us to grow. It's not geared to the needs of small and medium enterprises. We all know that. It's actually an offshore state op operating an offshore economy. And the best thing to do is to cut back on its scale. Mm 
Now, it's not just a left-wing economist saying that, because Lord Adair Turner has said, and he's the former head of the Financial Conduct Authority, has said too much of what happens in the city is socially useless. I'd say it's actually socially harmful. And behind Lord Adair Turner, you now have some very interesting papers coming out from the Bank of International Settlements saying the same thing. Beyond a certain scale of financial activity, it doesn't create wealth, it extracts wealth from the economy. And we are way, way beyond that level. And it's not just the Bank for International Settlements that's saying that. The International Monetary Fund is now saying similar things. Very interesting papers. And that's why we, on the left, can start talking a new language. We no longer need to say we're dependent on the City of London and we must continue to regulate it. Because otherwise, sorry, deregulate it, because otherwise uh, they'll leave we can actually say we'd be better off without them. We'd be a damn sight better off without HSBC and so on, who are always pushing for lower regulation and lower taxation, because they're a criminal organisation anyway. And I can say that without any risk to camera, without any risk of libel. Here's an interesting little chart. I don't expect you to see the small print on this, but... Um, this is, this is just back, and, and, and if you download the Finance Curse book, you'll see the, the full chart. This looks at the wealthiest countries in the world. It's just looking at the wealthiest countries, or so, you know, what's, uh, what the United Nations call the upper, higher wealth countries. But it does include countries like Cuba, which interestingly comes out of the top. What this does is it looks at the Human Development Index and looks at those countries which are worth their lot and says, how successful are these countries at converting their wealth into human development, education, longevity of life, social stability, stuff like that. And an interesting pattern emerges. You probably can't see it, but the yellow ones are the resource, the oil and gas things, and they are spectacularly bad at converting their wealth into human development. Anyone who knows about Saudi Arabia will know exactly what I'm talking about. But it's not just Saudi Arabia, there's Qatar and Kuwait and so on, United Arab Emirates and so on. These countries are spectacularly bad at taking their wealth and turning that into human development, the kind of human development that matters. You all know that. But an inter another interesting pattern that we picked up on, which absolutely backs the finance curse thing, is that these countries in red, almost all of which are tax haven economies with large offshore financial centres, including the United Kingdom, are also very poor at doing that. And anyone who's travelled in Europe and compares, for example, our infrastructure with infrastructure in Germany or in France or Spain or looks at the health services or the education services will know how much better finance and how, how much um, the, how, how vastly better their housing provision is. We in Britain have been spectacularly unsuccessful at turning our wealth, including North Sea oil and gas, into better welfare. And there's got to be a reason for that. And my view is that our economic policies for many, many years have been designed purely to meet the needs of a very tiny elite. And that was the strategy that the Labour Party bought into during the Blair years. You can agree with me or disagree, I don't mind. We can discuss that later on. But the Bla Blair more or less bought into this idea that Britain's future was essentially going to be a Thatcherite neoliberal thing. And as we say in the book here, despite the trillions that flow through the city of London every single week, Britain performs worse on major human development indicators, on inequality, infant mortality, poverty, blah, blah, blah. You could go on through a whole list. And if you want to see the whole list, read Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett's book, The Spirit Level. Have any of you seen it, read that book? It's a compelling list of failures on the part of our governments um, for decades to actually meet the general public need. And that Here's an interesting chart which I think bears this out. This looks, and this comes from, from the um, Institute of Public Policy Research, and, and interestingly, when it was published in 2012, not many people paid much attention to it, but this looks at Britain's investment between 1992 and 2012 by sector. And um, those of you with really good eyesight, can you all see this? 
we'll see what a spectacular underinvestment we have in manufacturing, mining, quarrying, agriculture, and so on, and a spectacular overinvestment in real estate activities and stuff like that. This is all symptomatic of a country which is putting rent seeking activity ahead of productive activity. Core to Labour Party's economic, and Tory Party, obviously, economic strategies. Does that all make sense? Yes. You're getting a full picture here. Okay, it's worth going back into the history of all of this to get some idea of how we got into this mess. Steve mentioned the Mont Pelerin Society, so I thought I'd bring in a slide about the Mont Pelerin Society. How many of you have actually ever heard of the Mont Pelerin Society? They're a fascinating organisation. They met, this is a group of economists who met immediately after the war in 1947 at a place called Mont Pelerin, just above Montreux in Switzerland. They met, and the hotel was called Mont Pelerin, Mount Pilgrim. They were headed by a, a fanatical Austrian called Friedrich von Hayek. You might have heard of him. Yeah. You've heard of Hayek, yeah, OK. Hayek, of course, was the antithesis of Lord Keynes, the English economist um, who, who famously said, look, capitalism will fail unless the state intervenes to manage demand. Hayek said exactly the opposite, but he was proved spectacularly wrong in, 19, in the 1930s. But instead of, kind of gracefully sailing off into the sunset, he and a bunch of others, including Milton Friedman and a bunch of Bank of England economists, met there to set up and set in, set in motion an extraordinary movement to subvert the social democratic pro thing. They said it, and they were very open about it. Amongst their supporters, we had this character here, Sir George Bolton, governor of the Bank of England, an absolute fanatic, the kind of right-wing nut job par excellence. <laughs> um, and he made it his, almost his personal mission behind the scenes he was funding the Mont Pelerin Society to, um, to, to reshape economics to overthrow the Keynesian settlement. In other words, to, to overthrow everything that Attlee and, and successive Labour Party leaders through to uh, Callaghan um, were, um, were, were trying to do in this country and others elsewhere. Sorry, I've forgotten what the link was there. Um, amongst other things, they were desperately pushing for um, an end to exchange controls because the exchange controls, um, once they were imposed in 1946, um, massive, really constrained the City of London's room for manoeuvre. It actually required City of London bankers to go out and look for real investment in productivity, productivity activity, which was not something they'd ever done before. Most of them had always been much more interested in imperial type of activity. Um, the City of London was never actually geared to in investing in, in industrial capitalism. So they didn't particularly like it, and they were keen to find bolt holes, and that's exactly what they did. They started to use Britain's offshore islands as little bolt holes through which they could move an awful, awful lot of money um, and, and act on behalf of their clients. Evidence that the Bank of England was heavily involved in, in building Britain's tax haven empire and starting this whole process of trying to, to overthrow government's ability to control the economy. We, we unearthed this, this Bank of England um, document marked secret uh, from the Bank of England archives. We know that we were the first people that outside the Bank of England to ever see this. Uh, and it was evidence that right from the 1960s, from the very early 1960s, the Bank of England and the City of London was, try was surreptitiously trying to create a parallel economy. The economy we know as offshore, the tax haven economy, to be able to operate outside the constraints of government. And what I found particularly interesting about this one was that it's quite clear that they, that they couldn't legally go against UK policy as far as UK citizens were concerned, but they were quite happy to go against the policies of other governments, no matter how much it harmed other governments. They were quite happy for British banks, as they say. They said, they said there's no objection to providing bolt holes for non-residents. In other words, helping people from other countries to, to work outside the legal and regulatory systems. Evidence that the Bank of England you know, really has never been the kind of proper state central bank, but there's plenty more evidence of that. 
They were trying to subvert the social democratic system right from the start. And from, for, for a lot, very long time, and this we dug out of a Treasury press cutting, this was the Sunday Times article, um, there was a lot of pressure from the 50s onwards to turn the City of London into an offshore tax haven. In other words, to be able to operate outside the regulatory controls set by the Bretton Woods settlement and by, by, by the government itself. This lobbying continued right the way through and famously, of course, once Mrs Thatcher was elected, she immediately implemented comprehensive um, dismantling of exchange controls in order to allow the City of London to start to operate completely outside of control of government, which is what they, they'd always wanted. This led to a situation, this begins to sound a bit like a lecture, but bear with me for a second. What happened next was the economy globally was totally, de at all intents and purposes, financial markets were deregulated. And very quickly, exchange and capital controls were eliminated, trade tariffs and taxes were significantly reduced. There was a massive expansion of cross-border trade and investment, including round tripping. What that meant, the round tripping, is that most of Britain's wealthy people shifted their money offshore, mainly to avoid paying tax or evade paying tax, and then brought it back to England dressed up as foreign direct investment. That way they could evade massive amounts of tax. Britain's economy became an offshore economy. And the most absurd example of that was that when, during Gordon Brown's chancellorship, they took the decision to sell off the offices used by HM Revenue and Customs up and down the country. No. Anyone know this story? Yeah, they, they a sell and lease back deal, deal, a classic kind of sell off the family silver. They sold it to a, a company based in Bermuda, Makeley Holdings, which doesn't pay tax here. That's what's been happening to the UK economy. We have largely sold our, our assets to offshore holdings. Look at the main health providers coming in under private sector provisions. Almost all of them operate out of tax havens. Same with the education providers who are gradually taking over the education system. Public assets were privatised. Public finance initiatives were built up. This is what's happened progressively from the 1980s onwards. In other words, what was previously state provided was handed over to the private sector at massive cost to us. But the case of private finance initiatives, those costs are not disclosed on the national balance sheet, so it doesn't appear as national debt, which is kind of cheating. We had a rapid growth of intra-company. All this means is that multinational companies began to really massively expand at this period. Um, and because of flawed transfer pricing rules, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a second, tax avoidance began to, to be a really major problem. And at the same time, countries like Britain started talking about well, we have to compete to attract investment. And that led us into this whole scenario of tax wars where we are racing to the bottom to subsidise companies to come to this country and invest in this country. And that combined with technology change, which has made it very much easier for people in this country, for wealthy people, to operate their accounts out of Switzerland or out of the Cayman Islands or whatever. This whole process which Mrs Thatcher set in motion, or rather accelerated, in the 1980s, come the 1990s, was very well established, was becoming, beginning to shape our economy to a massive extent, and we are beginning to lose huge sums of money. It was in that context that when Gordon Brown addressed the Labour Party conference in 1996, he said, I am going to sort all of this out. I am going to tackle Britain's tax avoidance problem. And he spectacularly failed to do that. That's the context of our Red Pepper article. And so, with capital, capitalism literally unbound, literally no longer regulated, we, had a, we now have a global problem of endemic tax evasion and avoidance. We have a global problem of tax wars as countries are racing to the bottom on their tax policies and on their regulatory problems, uh, policies. Um, we've had an almost complete breakdown of national tax sovereignty. And if you're unable to tax capital, what do you tax? 
income. You tax labor mm. and you tax consumers, VAT. In other words, what's happened, and this is why tax justice is something I think you all, you all on the left pay much more attention to, the tax charge has been shifted from capital to labor, mm. making labor relatively more expensive relative to capital, leading to less job creation, overuse of capital, underinvestment, in a rising, mounting inequality, less job creation, less innovation. The tax policies that have been created by all of these changes have actually been at the root of many of the problems that we now face, not just in Britain but across the world. Does that make sense to you? Does the economics of that make sense? Mm. That's the meta problem of, of allowing capital to move offshore to where it can't be taxed. If you can't tax capital, what do you do? You bump up VAT. You bump up national income uh, insurance rates and so on. Taxing labour out of the market. That's, these are the things that John McDonnell is wanting to, ca to tackle. Okay? I won't go on to that. I won't go on too much about that. But another, getting back to the finance curse, this is, is a report written by the US Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. Don't expect you to read the small print. But one of the problems that's come out of this huge structural change is that people in our community who we used to look up to as kind of the top ends of society, bankers, accountants, and lawyers, have gone crooked. I mean, seriously crooked. I've spent my whole life investigating these crooks. And when I say that HSBC is a criminal bank, I know what I'm talking about. Otherwise, I'd be in prison now because they could be doing me on, on libel laws. I can say that with total impunity. Their, ba their banking model has been a criminal model for decades, probably longer, because they were set up, would you believe, they were set up, Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation were set up to handle the narco traffic trafficking during the Opium Wars. You couldn't make it up, could you? But it's not just it's not just HSBC. Many of our banks, many of our big law firms, and many of our big accounting firms, without mentioning names, Price Waterhouse Coopers in particular, <laughs> who we investigate and disclosed over over Luxembourg leaks. If you're familiar with that story, we are behind that. They've been do, doing dodgy deals on behalf of their clients for decades, in a conspiracy against society. And we tend to think of these professional people as being, in some ways guardians of the public interest. That professional ethos disappeared decades ago. It's all part of the finance curse. Let me just explain a little bit about how multinational companies get away with avoiding tax, why it's become built into their business model, to the extent that in many cases, without tax avoidance, they wouldn't have a business model. It's what, that's what makes them profitable. They turn profit, the tax avoiding into a profit centre. Um, but they use all sorts of lovely language. They talk about supply chain planning. <laughs> this is a slide that came out of an Ernst & Young presentation. Ernst & Young is one of the big four accounting firms. And this was quietly taken on a... This slide was taken on a camera without anyone noticing it because <laughs> this is the type of slide that never goes outside the four walls. They don't distribute this. Here they're telling their clients how to allocate their profits to tax havens. Separating between what they call operating entities, in other words, where things actually happen, where the profits actually made, where economic activity takes place, and what they call hub entities for residual entrepreneurial profits. This is, these are the offshore things located in low tax jurisdictions, which we, you know as tax havens. Anyway, behind all of that jargon, they've created the core of the multinational corporation model. Um, they've turned tax avoidance into a major profit centre. And here's a quick example I'll walk you through to show how this operates. Because we are, we are told now that this is the problem of the digital economy. It's Amazon and Google, and they're all up there in the cloud, and therefore their activities are very difficult to, um, to tax because you know, they're resident up in the cloud. Um, mm -hmm. Even that's not true, mm -hmm. because when you use Google, the service they're providing, which is an advertising ser service, happens there on the screen mm -hmm. in your office when you're studying. 
That's where the taxable instances arise. But anyway, passing on from that, working with the Guardian newspaper, <coughs> I worked up a case study showing how bananas are traded. Bananas are not digitised yet. Yeah. We, yeah. <laughs> but following the same principles that you saw on the Ernst and Young slide, they turned bananas from a fruit into a set of intellectual property rights for tax purposes. So this is a case study which the Guardian printed. If you Google tax justice goes bananas, you'll pick up the whole story. It wasn't just the front page story. It ran to three full pages. Um, and the story goes roughly as follows. When you buy a pound of bananas in Asda in the hypermarket just across the way here, I think there's an Asda right here, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. yeah I thought so. I saw it on the way in. This is how your money is divided, allocated. So you're, you're sitting in England or buying, it, buying your fruit in England. 13 pence of your one pound stays there in the producer country, which in this case is Honduras. Um, and that, that's 1.5 labour costs, 10.5 production costs, 1p taxable profits. Okay? With me so far? Now, everything that happens now, of course, the boat leaves Honduras and goes straight to Britain, so the physical journey is quite a straightforward one, but everything that happens from now on happens within subsidiaries of the same company. Okay? Which just happens to be fives, but it could be any of the other big banana manufacturers. In fact, what applies to bananas applies to everything everything that's now traded across border around the world, okay? They charge themselves to a subsidiary in the Cayman Islands for the use of their own purchasing network. Just stop and ask, what does that mean? I'm still puzzling. <laughs> Whoops. They charge another subsidiary in Luxembourg for the use of their own financial services. They charge subsidiary in, the, in Ireland for the use of their own brand name. Now stop and think, how many of you go into your greengrocers or Asda's or whatever and say, I'll have a kilogram of your finest dole bananas, please? Mm -hmm. hmm? You don't. The only brand that has any value in bananas is fair trade. It's the only one. The others have no value at all. But they charge themselves nonetheless. Isle of Man use of their own insurance services. Jersey, use of management services. Bermuda, use of their own distribution network. And finally, it's exported or invoiced to the end user, to ASDA, and they add their retail markup and there's a taxable profit. This is called transfer mispricing or trade mispricing or whatever. All of these things, all of this happens within the same company. And what they're doing is they're charging huge amounts of profits because bananas are a very, very profitable activity offshore to accumulate profits where they can't be taxed. Now notice how many of these are British. Ireland is to all intents and purposes as well. This is, this is the logical result of the model of globalization that we pursued, where we deregulated, we didn't put the right rules into place, we allowed multinational companies to to take over our politics. And what is the problem? Well, it's actually it's all of these things. None of this works any longer. None of the, it's not just that there's a lack of legislative clarity or there's a lack of capacity when there's our authorities, not just that companies have become increasingly aggressive towards the societies within which they operate. The rules and guidelines are impracticable. It's all of these things and all of these has created a globalization that is not fit for purpose. It ain't just the digital economy if it applies to bananas, it applies to everything else. <coughs> and that might explain to you why we now live in such an unequal and an increasingly unequal world, where, in my opinion, claims that we can't afford the welfare state are hokum, are absolute nonsense. We can afford the welfare state. 
We just uh, can't afford this model of capitalism. Mm. And look at look at the type. Look at how that has distorted the model of capitalism to the point where we, capitalism now become a four-humped camel. This is this is from the Financial Times. They looked at the top 100 country companies, the FTSE 100, and said, how many subsidiaries do the top 100 companies registered in London have in tax havens? Well, the answer is 8,492. Do the maths. Yeah. In Delaware, Netherlands, Republic of Ireland, Jersey, Hong Kong, Cayman Islands, Singapore, Luxembourg, many of these are British, you notice. We're right at the core of this. Our model, of our development model for the last 50 or so years has had tax haven right at the core of it. It precedes Mrs. Thatcher. In fact, it goes back to 1956, specifically. Now, I don't often get quoted on the front page of the Daily Mail, but here I am anyway, 2006, talking about why Britain has become so corrupt. And the Daily Mail doesn't often cover corruption. <laughs> corruption is something that happens in another place. But at the core of my argument is that our pursuit of a tax haven model has corrupted absolutely everything. Our professions, our companies, the entire model has become corrupt in one way or another. I'm not talking about bribery. I'm talking about the way in which the institutions, the systems, the rules, the tax systems that we, we operate have all been undermined to the point where they're un inoperable. And this didn't happen by accident. <coughs> Our own experience of Jersey, you know, you're, for those of you who are not um, familiar with Jersey, there it is. It's a crown dependency. I was economic advisor there for quite a long time. My own experience of Jersey was that I went back to Jersey in 1986 to, to work for a company called Touche Ross, now called Deloitte Touche, you might be familiar with. Yeah. Um, and I was with them for some time. I was there to investigate. I didn't want a career with them. I was just there to investigate. I didn't tell them I was there to investigate. This is what my clients were up to. Okay? You can only discover this when you're inside the system. Once you're inside the system, I'm trained as a forensic accountant as well, by the way, as well as being an economist. Once you're inside the system, you can look at the files and you can see what your clients are actually doing. Far from engaging in good productive activity, our clients were all engaged at one level or another in either rent-seeking or criminal activity. And that's at the root of Britain's problem. We no longer have a, 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 a capitalist class which is that enormously interested in productive activity, in producing wealth. They call themselves wealth creators, but in fact they've become wealth extractors. Does that tie in with your experience? With what parasites. you can see? Hmm? It's the parasites. That's the polite word. Uh, that's the impolite word for <laughs> wealth extractors. Um, I'm going to come to an end there. But what I hope I've demonstrated, and this is just to open up discussion with you, is that Britain's tax haven model has not worked in our interests. The Labour Party must now reverse out of its collusion. The prawn cocktail offensive led to Labour conceding, not the other way round. Um, here's our own Prime Minister saying to Parliament 2013 when he was President of the G8 saying well, the problem's over. But our own investigation into the British tax havens and the reds here indicates every area of major failure in their policy thing. I won't go into the detail of this. Shows that far from being it, it, it's no longer being fair to talk about these places as tax havens. We show them to be wholly uncompliant wherever there's a red. And that applies to all of Britain's leading offshore tax havens. And they're deep, they are deeply embedded in the City of London's model. They are, they are the conduits through which all the capital flows in and out of Britain. So far from having sorted the problem, the problem remains largely unresolved. Uh, and when I wrote to the Queen back in 2013, when we published those things, and said, Your Majesty, will you please kindly do something about it? Because you're the head of state of all of these places. <coughs> <coughs> Look, it's not David Cameron's head there. It's your head. You're the head of state. That's got to mean something. 
you are in a position to ask your Prime Minister to, to do something about it. And she wrote a very polite <coughs> letter the following day saying, actually, it's nothing to, uh, there's nothing I can do about it. That's not correct. Strictly speaking, Your Majesty, you are perfectly entitled to tell your Prime Minister that you're concerned about the impact that your tax havens are having on two billion Commonwealth citizens kindly sort out this mess. She's not responsible for implementing it, but she can certainly say to the Prime Minister, I'd like you to do something about it. <laughs> and the idea that Britain can't intervene into the affairs of Jersey and Guernsey and, this, and the Cayman Islands is absolutely not true. It not only can intervene, it has the authority to do that, it also has the obligation, because in international law, Britain is responsible for their so-called good governance. So we could intervene. So when Gordon Brown's team told me, wringing their hands, and said, sadly there's nothing we can do about it, wrong, there's a lot we can do, and there's a lot we should do. Just to, to wrap up, the, none of this happens in a vacuum. The City of London does not operate in a vacuum. What happens in the City of London ripples out across the world. Now, some of you might think that the subprime mortgage crisis and all the banking collapses that occurred in 2008 and 2009 was an American problem that came over here. That's not strictly true. The real problem that hit Lehman Brothers and that hit AIG, the big insurance group, biggest insurance group in the world, happened in London. It was their London office that dragged them under. This is now well documented. And that didn't happen for no reason. It happened in London because London is spectacularly less regulated than Wall Street, would you believe? Mm. What happens here ripples out and affects the rest of the world. It raises risk premiums globally, harms the tax systems globally. It allows multinational companies to engage in economic free riding. That means they can take advantage of all the services we provide, the roads, the education systems, the training services, all of that they take advantage of, but they don't pay. That's called economic free riding reduces the efficiency of resource allocation, it increases the profitability of economic crime, it encourages rent-seeking activities. I could go on. It damages trust and institutional quality. In other words, our model has all of these corrupting effects, not just in this country, but around the world. I hope that makes sense. But the good news is, Mr. McDonald, there's plenty that we can do about it. Just for discussion and just to wrap up, the idea that there's nothing we can do about it is not true. We could introduce a financial transaction tax which would dampen much of the speculative trade that goes on in London. We could have a, introduce a land value tax and replace the business rates and the council taxes, which are very, very deeply regressive taxes hitting the poor much more heavily than rich people. We could replace them with a land value tax immediately, which by the way is supposed to be Labour Party policy, but somehow that got forgotten between 1997 and 2010. We could require trading and transactions to record on central registry and cut back on the high frequency speculative trading that's very, very profitable in London, which does nothing to improve the efficiency of capitalism. We could ban the revolving doors between Whitehall and, and the city. We could remove the remembrancer from Parliament. Does anybody know who the remembrancer is? Anyone ever heard of the Remembrance? Hands I mean, up. When I, when I was a student in Scotland, my checks, my grand checks came from the Queen and Lord Treasurer's Remembrance. Mm -hmm. The Remembrance is the City of London permanent representative with a very well equipped office that sits inside Parliament. Not an elected official, but an unelected appointed official who sits inside Parliament representing the City of London and reminding, as the name explains, suggests, reminding Parliament of the need to um, ensure that the City of London's interests are served. Look it up. Not many people know we have this unelected official sitting inside Parliament. And I can tell you, they are very, very... He, he is an extremely active lobbyist. So if you get rid of the City of London Corporation, 
and merge it with the Greater London Authority. We could reduce corporate political donations to, to less than 5,000 a year. We could um, prevent MPs from having second jobs within the City of London. We could prevent ministers from sitting on bank boards for at least five years after leaving office. We could and must review HM Revenue's fitness for purpose. We could commission a, we could, um, commission a commission of inquiry into Britain's tax haven dependencies and what can be done to um, get rid of them. And Richard Murphy's idea of creating an office of for fair tax to create a tax system that suits Britain's interests, by which I mean all of our interests rather than the interests of the City of London, all of that could be done immediately. And I think the vast majority of the public would buy it. Yeah? Yeah? Because I think the vast majority of the public buy this analysis that the City of London really isn't the wealth creator that this country needs. It stands in the way of the future that we all require. And that's the good news, because if you buy the finance curse analysis, which John McDonald does, then we can turn around to the City of London every time they say, don't regulate us or we'll leave, or don't tax us and we'll leave, and we'll say goodbye, we're better off without you. And I genuinely believe we are and would be better off without them. We need a national investment bank that is more focused on productive investment in small and medium enterprises. We don't need banks which are primarily interested in investing in real estate in Dubai. And that's the end of my story. <laughs>